Okay, so now we're going to welcome our next speaker, Lisa Eidman um, from Superior Farms. And she's going to give us an update and talk about some of the things that she's been doing um, through Superior for producers. Um, I'm really happy to have her here from California visiting in the lovely Kansas Spring. All right, I think that works. Perfect. Yep. I know I kept checking the weather. For those of you who may not know, I'm based in California, and so I kept checking the weather thinking it was going to be Arctic tundra back here. And I kept thinking, like, I must be looking at California weather because it keeps saying it's going to be 60 degrees. So I brought the sunshine with me, which I think you guys could all, all needed this winter, a little bit of a sunshine break. So um, it's, I always appreciate the opportunity to come back to Kansas. Um, I actually lived in Kansas for a period of time as a kid, just about an hour and a half south of here in the Flint Hills, and so it's always fun to come back. I did not tell my family I'm here, so I'm probably going to be in trouble for that, but we'll keep it on the down, though. Um, so I just kind of want to give you guys a little bit of an update um, from the Superior Farms perspective. I know I saw a lot of you guys in January at the Western Kansas meeting, and I talked to a few of you throughout the year. Um, but a few of the things I wanted to cover today, touch on consumer trends, since that's one of the most important pieces that we need to be aware of as sheep producers. Obviously, we want to make sure that we're producing a product that the consumers want. Um, some different innovation and technology that's happening in the industry. We saw a little bit of that at Joseph's Place using the EID tags. Um, and then how some of that really fits in with some of the things that we're doing in our plants in both Dixon and Denver with the camera grading, the producer portal. Um, and then we've also just recently launched a genetic test, which I want to touch on a bit, and then also a U loan program. And hearing from a few different folks saying that they're wanting to expand numbers or get into the business is always something that I appreciate about coming to Kansas because there's always some of that excitement um, and new folks wanting to get into the business. And so that's one of the tools that we have for that as well. So to touch on consumer trends, um, and I think if you read any of our industry publications, um, you have probably seen that there is a ton of interest from consumers, and consumers really, really like lamb. Um, we have kind of gone away from the time where, you know, it's the, the older mentality of lamb was associated with the war, and nobody wanted to eat it. Like, I think we've, we've gone past that. And so now, especially with the millennial foodies, that we have consumers wanting to try something different. They're wanting something local, so we have an opportunity to provide a local American lamb product. Um, but they do want to know the story behind it, and they want to make sure that it's sustainably raised, that it's antibiotic-free, that it's been potentially out on pasture. And so no matter what the story is, I think we all have um, a responsibility within the industry to make sure that we're, we're talking about what's happening at the farm level so consumers understand it, because they truly do want to know. Um, and one of the pieces, and uh, it's been a focus of our company because we've had some of the bigger customers of ours come to us and say, I want an antibiotic-free product. And we all know that when that meat is going through our facilities that we have to pass residue testing and that there's no antibiotics actually in the meat. However, consumers want an animal that has never received an antibiotic. And we can hash that out over the science and get into a lot of the different discussions within that, but unfortunately, the entire protein industry, all the livestock industries, I think kind of fell behind that opportunity to have a discussion with consumers that we probably should have had about 10 years ago, really explaining that. And so unfortunately, we are up against that when we're in the marketplace. And when we have con customers come to us, whether that's your Kroger's or Walmart's or your Cisco's in the food service world, if they say they want something, we have to figure out how to do it. Um, and so, thankfully, we've been able to have a really good relationship with a lot of those customers through the years. And although some of the transitions can be a bit frustrating, um, we continue to see, you know, a massive growth in some of those different specific categories. Um, one of the other areas that we have done a lot of focus on within our company is focusing on new products. Um, since we have consumers that haven't always experienced lamb, trying to find ways that is the easiest way to convince them to purchase it. So we have done a lot of pre-cooked items, um, and some of these things have gone into food service. We're actually in the process now of launching um, retail four packs of pre-cooked, pre-made sausages, so kind of like your Adele's and some of the different pork bratwursts and some of those. It'll kind of fall in that same category. But again, you know, it's and some of them are a lamb and pork blend, and some are a straight lamb sausage. And so any way that we can um, have consumers have a really good eating experience, 
You know, obviously, if everybody had the lamb that we had for lunch today, they would be an instant fan and would always be eating lamb. But um, we don't always have that capability of making sure that a consumer is cooking it properly at home. Um, and so obviously these new and these um, pre-cooked products is one way to get around that hurdle and it makes it a lot easier and more attainable for a lot of the consumers um, to have those products as well. Uh, we've also seen a lot of interest in some of the fast casual style restaurants. Um, Suvla is a chain. It has about 10 different restaurants now in the San Francisco area and it's kind of one of those you order at the counter and then sit down. But they have several menu items that is just lamb. Um, it's a very Greek style restaurant, so they have gyros, super delicious. They have huge rotisseries in their restaurant that's constantly cooking both lamb and chicken is pretty much the two proteins that they have. Um, and so that has been an awesome opportunity for us to really showcase the local story in California. Um, Torchy's Taco is another fast casual restaurant that's based in Texas. Um, but some of them are starting to make their way up into Colorado and stuff too. And we have worked with them the last few years to do, um, they have a special taco every December that's been a lamb taco. So again, you know, and some of those, it's not your fancy racks and white tablecloth restaurants anymore that we're looking at when it comes to the consumer side. It's really what is the easy, delicious way to have lamb. Um, I was on the East Coast last week. There's another kind of Mediterranean style, fast casual restaurant called Kava. Um, they have spicy lamb meatballs, braised lamb, and then like a stewed lamb. So three of their eight protein options within when you could it's kind of you get to choose all your different toppings and everything else that you go along the way are all American lamb. And so again, you know, it's seeing these in different types of restaurants. These restaurants are probably a 10 to $16 meal. Um, so within the cities, that's kind of a typical lunch for a lot of those folks. Um, but it's a great way to get lamb into some of those consumers. Um, one of the other areas that we have seen a lot of growth in is the cook in the bag leg. Um, this is something that we created with our Kroger stores. Um, and this was, we didn't think that it was going to work very well, but because Kroger came to us and said, we want something that can go next to the turkeys and the chest freezers in the store. And literally the consumer can go home and take that frozen leg and stick it in the oven and it's going to come out delicious. And we're like, you never stick frozen meat in an oven, but okay, let's try this out and try different cooking methods and what have you. And so it literally is a product that the consumer, you can cook it in the bag itself that it comes in. So it's kind of like a foil type bag. Um, it keeps all the juices in, it keeps it super delicious. And they literally can put that bag in the oven with a frozen piece of meat and have a beautiful leg of lamb um, for their guest for dinner, whether it's a holiday and what. And so we've seen tremendous growth with Kroger in that. Um, I was talking to one of our sales guys uh, that covers our Walmart stores, and he actually said that looking at some of the Walmart data, we are now selling more seasoned, or Walmart is selling more seasoned legs than they are a traditional leg, um, which we would have thought would have never passed each other up. But again, it's that opportunity for a consumer, it's taking one step out that the consumer doesn't have to do. We've already got it seasoned, it's ready to go, and all they have to go home is cook it. So a lot of really cool opportunities within the marketplace, both retail and food service. Uh, this is an example of some of our packaging. You know, like I mentioned, we try to tell the story as much as we can, and so this picture here um, are the Nays from Idaho, and that, their ranching story is on the package of every I think it's the loin chops that they're on. Um, but every single different cut that we have for retail space has a producer story on the back of it. And so that's something, again, that um, we have had a lot of interest in. And I think as you guys, if whether it's on social media or just talking to your neighbors more and more, um, those consumers want that story. Here's an example. Um, I was hoping Katie Oligary, who is working on her PhD here at K-State, was going to be here. But this is a picture of actually her folks who live in California. Um, and she actually, I think it was about two years ago, she texted me and she's like, I am in a grocery store in Kansas and I just saw my parents on the back of a meat package. <laughs> so it's cool to kind of see how that goes across the country and um, really be able to showcase those stories too. So no matter what we do, we have to make sure that what we are providing in that meat case is what the consumers want. And so that kind of hits on that. Um, so then I kind of want to dive deeper into some of the things that within the industry that we're working on. Yep, do you have a question? Like 
So they are using just straight legs and then seizing in it, putting it on a rotisserie, and then slicing it really thin. Um, there are a lot of euros typically made with the meat that's off the cone that's shaved off in that too. Um, but yeah, they're just using straight legs, so that's pretty cool. Um, so now to dive deeper into kind of the programs that are affecting you guys as producers. Um, some of this technology we have in play in Dixon and will soon be in play in Denver, um, but it's something that we as a company truly believe in, of really looking at innovation and how to be doing things a little bit differently um, that is more efficient for everyone within this industry to make sure that we're able to provide those consumers the products that they're after. So the first one I want to touch on is electronic um, camera grading. Um, it's our, so in our Dixon facility, we are officially using the camera as our USDA grader. We still have to have USDA on site, um, and they have to verify every day that it's working and that it's validating um, all of the grades correctly. But there's a lot of other really good information in the camera um, that we're able to utilize as well. And because there is so much information, this is why we really started working with folks and encouraging producers like Joe's and some of the others to really start using the EID tags. And I know Ron Gibson's another example of really having some success using those EID tags and the information it can share with you as a producer. But then tying all that back um, at the plant level is extremely important too. And so we have readers in our pens in Dixon, and then we also have an EID reader for, ta for the tags um, inside the plant as well. And I'll show you some of those pictures. And that's also we can then give that carcass data information back to you as producers on an individual animal basis rather than a lot basis, which is what we have typically done historically. We are in the process of implementing the same technology in Denver, and I know that's what's most important um, within this part of the world because this is where a lot of your lambs are going, and so um, we are anticipating that the Denver implementation will be done by the end of this year, hopefully this summer. Um, but it, it hasn't been an easy process, and for those of you that have heard me speak ever since I've started with the company, um, it's been one that we have talked about for many years. Um, USDA really loves their old way of grading, um, and so it did change a lot of processes that we had to make within the plant, um, and USDA has to approve every single one of those processes along the way which is good to make sure that the technology is working and that they are a partner in this, but at the same time, since it did change the way that they are used to doing business, it, it did create some obstacles. Um, we also had to get the USDA graders are uh, part of a labor union themselves, and so then everything that we also wanted to change, their labor union had to approve. So it turned into a lot more of a messier process at times, but at the same time, we did get the approval. Um, and then this to me is just funny. So the camera has to get locked whenever it's not in use. And every morning before we can start kill, we have to have USDA. USDA has to be one of the first ones at the plant. They have to unlock the machine themselves because we are not allowed to have a key even though it's our equipment and we purchased it. Um, and then they have to validate it and run the validation test and then they have to make sure that they're there watching the camera take pictures. <laughs> and so we've turned it into a joke of the infamous key, and we worry a little bit if our USDA grader decides not to show up one day. Um, but ultimately, you know, the key belongs to them and the technology behind it. And so there are a few little snafus that we have to get through, um, but at the same time, the information that comes from this is definitely worth it. Um, so what does the camera collect? And I know I've talked to a few of you about this previously, but just as a quick reminder, um, it takes two images of every carcass, and I'll show you an example of this. And from those two images, in an algorithm based on the color and the sizes, um, it is able to calculate the USDA yield grade, the USDA quality grade, and then it can also project what each of those primals will weigh. So it'll tell you what the le leg, rack, loin, neck, breast, trotter, and shoulder all weigh within that carcass, um, which to me is some really cool information to be able to feed back to you as producers as you're looking at genetics and trying to figure out which sires are giving you the highest quality pieces of meat, um, and especially when we tie that back to the consumers and really trying to provide the consumers that ideal product. The other cool thing that we're able to do in our plant in Dixon, because we have RFID trolley tracking, and for those of you that have been in the plant have noticed that, that once a carcass enters our kill floor, it's never, once it's 
especially leaves the kill floor and into the coolers, it's no longer touched. Like everything is automatic as to how it moves. So we can say if we know that we're going to be packaging loin chops for Walmart on Tuesday, Monday when those lambs are ending in the cooler, we can say that all loins weighing nine to nine and a half pounds can go on one rail within the cooler and then those will all enter fab at the same time. So we'll be able to have far more consistency when we're doing some of these packaging, whereas now we just kind of say, okay, these carcasses weighed 70 pounds, these will enter fab at the same time. Um, there's some really cool efficiency pieces that we're able to do at the plant as well. And then the third piece is that it also calculates an ovine carcass cutability, um, and that's more or less the percent of that carcass that'll be used for retail cuts. Um, and so to me, that's even more information, like now we refer to dressing percentage as being something that is a cool piece of information, and it definitely is, but this kind of takes it to a whole nother level of really knowing how much usable product is in every single one of those carcasses. So then to touch on what those readers look like, um, it's more or less, you know, like I mentioned, we've got the readers. It's, many of you have them on your farm now, whether it's the handheld or some of the readers that they walk through. But we have the panels and the pins, and then literally once that carcass is there, we know that that carcass was that lamb at any, when they entered the plant. Um, so as we've developed all of this new technology and wanting to make sure that we can give the information back, you know, it's kind of a big circle of working with you guys and how you have your production softwares um, working as well. So if we use Ron as an example who's been using the EID and has his own management software, he's got that information stored and ready to go. Um, and it starts with your database. This is a picture of the readers that we have at the plant in Dixon. Very similar ones will be going into, Dixon, or into Denver as well. Um, and that, this literally just reads every single ear tag that goes by, and then that's transmitted up to into the plant, so then that way we know the series of ear tags. The other cool thing is, is that if, as we have seen more commercial producers start utilizing these tags, that the truckers can then start using this to count the sheep coming off the truck as well, um, because it does have pretty, I mean, the accuracy rate is pretty exceptional. Um, and so we've all tried to count sheep as they're either being loaded or unloaded, and sometimes you're really good at it, and other times it's like, oh crap, I forget what number I'm on. So, I mean, using this technology to really help with that will help as well. Um, and then this is on the line, so it's kind of hard to see. So this is the bleed table, so as the lambs are after they're cut, they are here and then their feet kind of enter. I should have, well, it's a little bit bad. So here are the hooks that the feet are on and then this is the panel that they'll go by. So then in the hooks inside the plant also have RFID chips in them. So then the ear tag chip then is relayed back up into the hook chip and then that's how we're able to track that individual lamb through the plant through the rest of the process. And so there's a lot of technology, and never in my life did I think I would make best friends with the IT department in our company, but whether they like it or not, <laughs> they have decided that they have to like me and my projects. Um, but at the same time, so there's a, you know, it's a massive amount of technology, but it's all worth it in the end. Um, so then you can kind of see the top here, like I said, the hooks carry this through. This is actually part of the plant where the pictures are being taken, um, the blue screen, which is harder to see in that picture, but um, the blue screen, every single carcass has to go past that blue screen and that's where the photo is taken for the grading process. Um, and it's all the color calibration and everything that goes along the way. So if we go back to that feedback loop, you've got your producer management, we've got the EID reader at the plant, we tie that with the camera, and then once that information um, is what lives within our producer portal, and so the data within the producer portal is then now being built into this entire process as well because we're using those EID tags. Um, so the portal itself is all of the data that's collected from the camera. So if Ron sends us lambs on Tuesday, Wednesday afternoon, he's going to get an email from us that says, hey, your lambs have been processed and here's all the data. So he can then log into his password protected information and we'll only see his lambs data, but every single producer that's sending lambs through will see all of their own lambs. 
um, that lives in, this is kind of the home page of it, and a variety of reports and information can be derived from it. And then this is an example of just one of the lambs. So if you pull up your lamb, if your lot of lambs from that day, you can then just start clicking through and looking at every single one of them. Um, in this case, this lamb didn't have an EID tag, so it doesn't have the EID tag listed. Otherwise, it'll be one of the options. Um, but this is obviously the back view image of the carcass. Um, the hot weight on this one was 77.3 pounds, sealed grade 2.78, quality grade choice. Uh, the OCC percentage was 67.3%. The breast weighed 9.7, rack weighed 9.3, shoulder weighed 19.1, legs weighed 25.1, 8.8 8 loins, 1.7 neck, and 3.1 trotters. And so, obviously, a ton of really cool information within that, though, um, and really trying to look at... And that kind of falls within somewhat of the norm. Obviously, your legs and shoulders are always going to be your heavier cuts. Um, we've been really focused on looking at kind of where the loins and rack weights continue to fall um, and kind of what the overall consistency seems to be within that, and that's something that we continue to track. Yep. Yeah, so you'll still get, if you're, so EID tags are encouraged. Um, we have only required, we process a lot of the fair lambs in California, and they've been the only ones that we've said, okay, you have to start doing this, but that's for fair traceability purposes. Um, if you are a producer, though, and says, I don't want to use EID tags, that's fine, you don't have to, but you're only going to then get this, you'll still get this information, but you won't know which lamb is which, right? So you'll just get it back as a lot and then say, okay, I can sort through it and still look at it, which is still good information. Um, and we realize that not everybody in the industry, whether large or small, will be able to convert to those tags. Um, and my only hope is that one day we see those tags either included as your free scrapey tags or they become just as cheap as some of those options. And I think we'll probably get there. Um, one of the undersecretaries at the USDA last week when a bunch of the sheep people were in town actually said that he hoped that the scrapey tags would be used as EID as they continue to look at that program and that. So I think there's a lot of interest within all of the industries to encourage the use of the EID tags, but we aren't requiring it and you don't have to have them in order to sell lambs to us. Uh, this is an example of another report within the portal. Um, so of course, you can download this data and then put it into your own management software as a producer, or you can run a lot of different reports and looks at it within um, the program itself as well. This one um, looks at how loin weights compared to the carcass weight. So if that graph was bigger, if this graph was bigger, it'd be easier to see, but you can kind of see how the overall carcass weight corresponds with the loin weights on those. Um, this one looks at the average loin weights within each of the carcass categories. And then one of the cool things about those, these last two graphs is that it also compares you to the average within that plant that you had your lambs processed at. So you'll then start knowing how you compare to your neighbors, even though your neighbor's always honest when you ask them individually, I'm sure. Um, but this will really start telling you as to how your lambs are comparing um, to all the other lambs that are being processed in either Dixon or Denver. And we'll have two averages because we do have a little bit of different types of lambs processed to each of those plants. Um, but it will kind of give you that comparison. And then this is literally just a list of every single one of those lambs um, within that lot as well. And so you can look through it in that aspect um, too. So there's a lot of different ways to look at the information. And there's probably more information there than we will ever know what to do with. But I think it's a really cool step in something beyond just a kill sheet that says 50 head of lambs and this number will yield grade twos and this number will yield grade threes, but really taking it to the next step of um, some of that detailed information. Yep. Correct. Yep. 
Um, so then one of the other port parts of the program is that you can compare up to five different lots at a time. So if you're not using EID tags, but you kind of know how some of your lamps have been sorted out, then you could just deliver them in different lots, and then you could run some comparisons that way too. You can run comparisons from year over year to two years ago, um, once that data lives in there for that period of time. But it really starts letting you kind of see how things change through time um, and in comparison to the different lots that you have delivered over that period of time as well. So coming back to the feedback loop then, um, being able to download that data from the portal into your management software or into whatever type of program that you choose to use or even just being able to look at it in the portal is obviously a big piece of making sure that we have that full circle of information being able to share with producers. Um, I kind of touched on this. Obviously, there's a lot of individual land performance. There's the lot performance within that. Um, but then also really being able to track lambs from birth to slaughter. Um, so then that way you can really know, OK, was it genetics? Was it production changes? Was it a feed change? Was it the time of year? Um, a lot of different information and full transparency from us as well as the type of information that's being provided through the portal. And then one of the pieces that I think is most important, and I think a lot of the folks that are part of NSIP and are selling seed stock rams, you know, making sure that that information gets back to them. So if you know you used a certain number of rams, and you can then start sharing that back. Because I think sometimes within our industry, we get information, or a feeder gets information, but maybe it doesn't always make it back to the producer, or the producer gets the information, but they're not always relaying it back to whoever they're buying rams from. And so we hope that this kind of really pushes that information all the way through and back to the seed stock folks so then that way they realize and understand the value of some of those sires that we have in the industry as well. So then the last piece that I want to talk about um, is a genetic test that we have launched to the industry um, just this last year. Um, and it kind of closes this full circle of EID and carcass traceability and understanding the full potential of all of this information. Um, the primary goal, and everyone is always like, why is Superior Farms getting involved with genetics? You guys process and sell the meat, just do it. Um, but our goal was is that we realized that there is some really cool genetic technology out there for cattle and swine and um, even internationally within the sheep world, but it wasn't always coming back to the U.S. sheep industry. Um, and so, and if it did, it wasn't at a price that was effective whatsoever for our industry. So our goal with it was to create a reasonably cost genetic test um, that would ultimately increase flock efficiency, it would increase your producer margins for yourselves at their farm gate level, um, and then also increase the number of lambs in the U.S. flock, which I think is one of the most important pieces as well as, as we look at, you know, we've stayed pretty stable within our industry in the last five to six years, and I think that's a good thing. But if we can kind of rebound and really see those numbers come back and increase, it'll be an even better. So what exactly is it? The super scientific terms, it's a genotype marker panel um, that looks at a variety of different markers, and I'll get into those. Um, it was a collaboration that we worked with the University of Idaho on. Um, and more or less, we were able to kind of create this test that's typically in the $50 to $60 range, um, down to $16 to $20 per test. And what this panel does is it will determine parentage, and I'll kind of break that down. It looks at a variety of single gene traits, and it also looks at some of the multi-gene traits. Um, so some of the single gene traits are your disease resistance. So some of these already exist as a standalone test now, um, but now it exists all on one panel. And so instead of testing just for scrapie or just for OPP or just for spider, it all exists on one panel and one test. Um, it also tests for twinning or fecundity, um, looks at that genetic marker. Um, there's some in regards to fleece variation, yellow fat, which is more of an international um, gene that a lot of different countries have looked at, but we included it on the panel just because we don't really know if that is an issue of the U.S. sheep flock. Um, double muscling or the calipes, which a lot of folks, of course, are interested in and wanting to know and then also horned or pulled. And so those are some of just the simple, more straightforward traits that it looks at. Um, and then some of the multi-gene traits are your milk quality and quantity, which is important if you're also looking at increasing the number of lambs, um, wool, staple length, and quality. 
meat quality, which is obviously an important one as we talk about all these different additional pieces of information that we're collecting. And then the parentage test, which is something that as we talk about using the EID, and if we are breeding in groups, we don't always know which sires are giving us some of those better lambs. And so the parentage test will, if you're collecting DNA from both the rams and the lambs, then you'll be able to identify exactly which sires are giving you either the really, really good lambs and really good carcasses or some of the lower performing. And then if some folks are, even want to trace it back to the mothers, if you're breeding out on, or lambing out on the range, then there's some cool information within that as well. Um, but as folks start, we've definitely seen more folks on the parented side interested in the sire piece of it. So how does it work? You as a producer collects the sample, um, whether it's if you are ear notching or tail docking, that's a piece of tissue that is perfect for this type of collection and test. Um, blood tubes will work and then also TSUs. TSUs unfortunately have a little bit of an extra cost that goes along with them, t blood tubes as well. Um, but thankfully, we are working with a lab that is very excited about getting tails and ear notches delivered to them in the mail. Um, and so, but it's a great resource. And part of our process with that was that we didn't want something to slow down the process of you processing lambs, right? When you're either docking or tagging or whatever your process is differently at each ranch, it seems like. Um, trying to figure out a way to do something but not slow it down. So. I worked with some commercial producers in California, and they notch their lambs when they're processing them. So I said, well, instead of throwing that on the ground, let's put that in a bag, and we'll use that as your piece of tissue. And the same with the tails. If you're hot docking tails, and that's something that typically gets tossed, like, keep that instead of discarding it. Um, and it's definitely not as scientific, although it's a piece of tissue and it works, but um, it's a little bit more of an organic way of collecting. So then, once the samples are collected, you send those in. Um, the DNA is then extracted. It's then genotyped. It's then analyzed. And then you get a report back that will tell you which markers it has. It'll give you a parentage analysis of which sire is most likely um, of that lamb. Um, and again, that's something that you can then build into your own management software. And we've been working with some of those folks that have the softwares out there to make sure that all of this additional information can fit within it. And I think we're pretty close to getting there with some of those companies. Um, otherwise, it's kind of looking at it in analysis and through Excel spreadsheets and what have you. Um, but really being able to tie all that information together is going to be pretty impactful, um, especially when, if we go back to the picture of the lamb on the, within the portal, and we know that that lamb was one, two, seven, eight, and he belonged to sire five, six, seven. And you can then start really looking at seeing which of the sires um, are providing you some of those higher quality lambs or lower quality in the case that will happen too. Um, so here's an example of some of just the very simple traits and some, or some of the simple information that could come back. This is obviously far more simple. Um, look at it. But if you have four ewe lambs that you're trying to decide if you want to keep them or cull them, um, and if you look and say, okay, ewe lamb one has the fecundity gene, she's not going to be a very good milker low, and she's going to have horns. Ewe lamb two, no to the fecundity, no to milk, and she has horns. Ewe lamb three, she's a higher fertility ewe, she ha is going to be a good milker, and she's going to be pulled. So you can start trying to look at those different decisions, and you not necessarily making your decisions based on just one single gene trait, but really looking at how they all impact one another. You would most likely probably decide to send ULAM2 down the road and send her to Denver. Um, but whereas ULAM3, you're probably going to want to keep for yourselves or sell her as a replacement because she's genetically is going to be a far superior, more productive type U. So then just kind of coming back to that feedback loop, um, if you're utilizing all of these different pieces, I know it's a little overwhelming and a ton of information, um, but at the same time really trying to close that loop of everything that's happening with all of the different technologies that we've talked about through the years and really trying to have that full transparency and the full feedback throughout the entire process. Uh, let's see. So then, oh, did you want a picture of that, Matt? Okay, good. 
Um, so then lastly, I want to touch on you financing, and I know we have set this program up um, with quite a few producers here in Kansas, and we are always trying to expand this as well. Um, we understand that sometimes banks, hopefully there's no banker in here that's going to throw something at me, doesn't always understand sheep. Um, they understand cattle and they understand pigs really, really well, but when we've had some of the younger guys and gals go into a bank and they are pretty much laughed out saying like, I don't understand sheep, I'm not going to give you any money, good luck, go talk to somebody else. And so, as we are hearing that as being a pretty big barrier of entry for producers, we said, okay, well, what can we as a company then do to help kind of get over that barrier? And so, we've set up kind of a U financing that then also turns into a long-term contract. Um, and we will advance up to 50% of the value of the U's purchased. Um, and then you more or less are paying that loan back over three years by delivering the lambs to us. Um, and then we'll keep a portion of each of those deliveries through time to pay that loan back. Um, and so we've had, you know, folks anywhere from buying 200 U's to I think one of our biggest one, bigger ones was like 1,500 U's in the West. And so it really does vary in different size and production. And obviously each of you have different ability of risk and what have you. But um, we are pretty flexible. There's not one like this is the only way it will work. Uh, I think every contract looks a little bit different. Uh, so kind of an example of walking through how that works. If you're going to buy, as a producer, you receive an advance in the amount of 30000 to purchase six to purchase 30 U's, so total purchase price was 60000 for those U's. Um, you as a producer commit to deliver the lamb crop from these U's for the next three years to Superior. Each year, a deduction of $10,000 will be taken from each delivery of lambs through that year period of time. Um, and then when the final load of lambs is delivered, interest will be paid, total advance in the loan. And there's several instances where a lot of producers have paid this back in a year and a half or two years and then they're debt free but still have a contract if they choose so then that way they still have somewhere to go with the lambs too. And we also try to always build in to, depending on how many ewes you purchase, we realize that there can be wrecks with weather and you want to keep some replacements back or what have you. So there's some different ways of, it doesn't always have to be you have to deliver X number of lambs. Um, there is some variability there as well. So that's kind of how, that's a quick summary of a lot of the different programs that we've gone through. If you have questions about the camera grading, Flock 54, the test, uh, or the U loan program, I'm more than willing to answer questions now. Um, I'm always available either via my email or my cell phone number. Um, and I've, I've talked to quite a few folks, but at the same time, if if there's ever any interest, any, any day of the week or time of day, I will always get back to you. So, We do have to be, yeah, any questions? Yep. Yeah, so it depends a little bit. We, our ideal weights, it's kind of 65 to 80 pound carcass. If we, like if you look at things on a bell curve, right? Like if the biggest part of the bell curve could always fit within that, then things are going really, really well and you're gonna hit a target and have a good price for those lambs. We have customers that want lighter lambs and we have customers that want really big lambs. And so there's always, it's keeping that balance more or less. And so it does depend a little bit on the time of year, um, where if there's a huge surplus of a lot of really big lambs sitting in the feedlots in Colorado, then that weight category is typically discounted a bit more. Or if they start falling in the yield grade fours and fives, because that means there's a lot more fat to have to trim that we have to take off in the plant. So it varies a bit. And then on the lighter lamb side, um, especially if we have, if there is a, ethnic holiday happening or um, a need for some of those lighter lambs, then we see the lighter lamb market increase. So there's a lot of different factors that it's not like it's the same every day, unfortunately, which makes it a little bit tricky, um, but it varies. I think for docking, the biggest docks typically come with a yield grade four or five, or if the lambs go ungraded or because they're over a year old is when you would start seeing some of the bigger discounts.
Does that answer your question? Okay. Anything else? Did I do okay, Ron? Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you.